Good afternoon. Thanks everyone for joining us. We have the honor of having with us this afternoon, Radeen Kagi Olalo, Bill Harrison, and Chandra Sims. Rather than take time away from this short podcast, you're welcome to Google them online and get their backgrounds. They're all very, very well qualified and experienced to talk about our subject today, which is racial and ethnic disparities in times of COVID. And we're seeing that both in the societal population, in the prison population, and in other sectors of society. Reading, what's been your experience and awareness? Yeah, um, you know, it's it's really interesting how COVID has actually brought to light even uh, uh, more how how America um, America is not equipped to. Um, be equitable or handle um, crises. And uh, it's overwhelmingly affecting um, black and brown people disproportionately um, in ways that I don't think we've, we've seen before. Um, I, I think a big, I watched uh, ABC 2020 the other night uh, called the American Catastrophe where they uh, went through the timeline of COVID in America. And it's, it's quite appalling because a lot of the fact, um, the way what we're seeing now is due to the fact that we didn't have access to information, that information was withheld from the beginning. Um, and a lot of, when we talk about racial uh, disparity, we also have to look at class. So the quote unquote essential workers who worked in our supermarkets and our fast food and our, our meat packing production uh, companies were all majority people of color, you know, and they were the ones out on the front lines getting exposed. Um, we're also finding a lot of uh, prisoners are being exposed to COVID without any possibility of social distancing and that continues to be uh, swept under the rug, which is very concerning. And if you look at the prison population, uh, it's overwhelmingly Blacks and, bra and Latina and Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians. So uh, it's very concerning how, how COVID is um, highlighting the racial disparities in our culture. So it seems to be that one of the things happening is that COVID actually, as some commentators have suggested, seems not to be changing patterns in society, but accelerating and even accentuating those disparities. Yes. Bill, do you see that in the work and life that you experienced? Oh yeah, absolutely. The, uh, the prison population, as we know, is overwhelmingly uh, uh, unbalanced with the uh, people of color being uh, uh, the largest percentage uh, of the population in the prisons. Uh, now with the, the COVID epidemic going around the prisons itself, as you said, we don't have the ability to distance ourselves. We don't have the ability to protect ourselves in that uh, close quartered situation. So um, what's happening is, is we're getting reports of lockdowns going on where obviously we can't get access to our clients uh, on a regular routine basis to confer with them in preparation for hearings and trials. That, that really uh, falls disproportionately on those people of color because those are the ones that are in prison. So clearly this COVID issue just highlights um, our disparity in the prison, correct on that issue. Are we getting a sense that the playing field, if anything, is becoming even more tilted against those people? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, obviously, you know, the, the prison population being such a disparity in the population, um, it, it, it falls, obviously on economic lines. Uh, and so you have the, the poor of, the, of our society being incarcerated at higher levels. Um, they're not um, getting uh, the, the nature of the type of representation that uh, they should be getting under those circumstances. They can't get out of prisons because of our uh, pretrial release uh, provisions uh, and our bail structure. So uh, they are obviously getting the worst of the worst uh, in this situation. Mm. And we're seeing that in society as well, I think. Sandra, you shared with us a really cogent article that just came out today where <laughs> Professor Kalolo Kula at the med school and Jocelyn Howard with yes. We Are Oceania have shared 
statistics and life factors that are accentuating this. What are some of the things that you've seen that are worsening the situation for that population? The article that I sent you really kind of focused on what's happening here in, in, in Hawaii as it pertains you know, to the um, Micronesian and Pacific Islander population, which doesn't get a lot of attention in a lot of the mainstream media because they're focused more on the information that they have at their disposal. But one of the things I kind of wanted to, that, that kind of struck me as we started doing the work in this was the notion that what COVID has really done is that it's just kind of ripped off this scab of underlying racism that is, uh, that is in all aspects at the very core of our society. We're seeing it in criminal justice. We're seeing it in housing. We're seeing it in employment. We didn't talk about, you know, the people that are on the front lines of, you know, who, who can't work from home are those that are most exposed, um, you know, in those uh, in lower income jobs and service jobs and so forth. Not that we shouldn't have them, but at the same time, it kind of makes it clear to us who's doing that work and how, and how our patterns and history of discrimination have affected who gets to do those kinds of things. And that's another piece that's kind of, um, concerning. And the piece that I shared with you, basically, I was kind of stunned to see it as well. When you talked about the percentages of um, Pacific Islanders and um, Native Hawaiians who are affected by COVID is so is vastly disproportionate to the population more so uh, than what we've seen in black and brown communities on the mainland. I mean, the figures they were showing us like the, the gap is something like, what is it, 25% that Pacific Islanders make up like 25% of the population that's, that's, that, that is diagnosed with, with COVID. And we're talking about people that are like 4% of the population. So that number is quite honestly, it's obscene uh, when you think about it in terms of, of why that particular segment of the community is exposed. And part of it is, again, goes back to the notion of the kinds of racism. Um, you, I'm, I'm working with a group at one of the schools and we found out that we were doing some you know, service projects at the school. It has a population that has a lot of Pacific Island and Micronesian students. And what the principal was telling us that was, why our work was so important was that because on Fridays, if there was a holiday, they were concerned because if the kids went home, they didn't get to eat because the meals and food they had came at school and breakfast and lunch, and it was a school had a pantry, and we were helping to kind of, you know, um, stop the pantry so kids could take food home discreetly, not home, but take food discreetly on Friday so that they would have something to eat over the weekend. So you're looking at all of these kinds of disparities that are just sort of being exposed now. We all, everybody see it. Some, some of us were seeing it all along, but then you, more people are seeing it, and I think that's another piece that's happening with COVID is that this inherent racism that's at the core of so much of what we do is really being exposed and shown for all to see. You can't turn your head and say you don't know about it because it's so clearly obvious in housing patterns and education and work and certainly in the numbers of people who are, um, who are getting COVID and dying from COVID. Um, that's, that's the concern. So if we're facing a situation where conditions are actually worsening for the most marginalized and oppressed groups, what are the solutions in society? Where are the sources to reverse this tide? Mm -hmm. uh, so, and so I think um, help needs to come from grassroots, from community level. I think that's the only way that we're going to see a real transformational change. I mean, we live in a capitalist economy. So even when we talk about prisoners, I mean, the general public will think, well, they did a crime, they should be in there anyway. But the reality is people don't know that a lot of people who are incarcerated are sitting there pre-trial because they can't afford a thousand dollars bail or they are low level offenders that are eligible for community level custody. Um, so there's a lot of factors that people need to realize that if we're talking in terms of a capitalist structure, you're always going to have folks that are just going to dismiss what um, what we're talking about today. And 
really, you can't, because if you keep dismissing it, we're going to collapse. Everything is going to collapse. Yeah, I think another important point, point of the article that Sandra shared with us is that you're looking at groups that come from very cohesive, coherent, collectivized cultures. And mm -hmm. this kind of pandemic that actually winds up working against them because they're marginalized and forced in on each other, and yet they're deprived of access and disconnected from access to the resources and the information that might enable mm -hmm. them to have better health choices, better work and economic choices, better housing choices and education choices. And that's been systemic in the society for a long time now, and if anything, getting worse. Yes. Yeah, I totally agree with everyone else uh, in the comments that were made. Uh, this point that, you know, it, it, we look at people who are marginalized, um, as Redeen says, that he, those people don't have access to the, to the uh, types of, um, of, of um, programs, of types of monies, et cetera, to a system throughout the, you know, the judicial system. And, and realistically, we can, we're not going to get any better uh, at uh, helping these folks. Um, we try to, to um, obviously look to education, look to, to equality in terms of jobs and the like, but uh, we need, uh, as Radine says, we need le uh, leaders that are going to look at other possible issues such as pretrial mm -hmm. confinement uh, review um, to, to restructure that, uh, restructure minimum sentences, uh, restructure mandatories. Um, all of those things that go into this whole process it becomes systemic and, and adversely affects that uh, marginal uh, population. So clearly we need to rework everything. It's not that there's no one um, uh, matter that's going to actually help uh, the, uh, individuals in these situations. Mm -hmm. Collectively, we have to look at all types and, and um, all of the, the um, available um, remedies in the exactly. system and uh, change the laws uh, wholesale. And there's so many. I think there's, I almost want to say there's a, there's a place for everybody to take a stand and get involved in how we address these issues as a society because there's so widespread and I think we're kind of realizing begin well some of us are beginning to see how they're all connected um in resulting in these disparities. Look at our healthcare system for crying out loud. Why is it so darn difficult to provide health care to people? What's that what well, we do know why, but at the same time, I think we're recognizing now that for all that we have in terms of our, our wealth as a nation, some of the best hospitals and, and, and clinics in the world, we're still not able to figure out a way to get health access to health care to people who don't have money or don't have, you know, elaborate insurance programs. And for a country, the country like the United States, again, that's just an abomination. That's just not, it's, it's just wrong. And it's the other piece that is adding to why this, why COVID is again impacting more and more marginalized communities because they already haven't had access to care um, to begin with. And so when you add on a pandemic disease like this, it just makes it, it makes it even worse. And the impact on the rest of, maybe this is what's gonna help because it's having an impact on the rest of society. Because when you have, you know, marginalized folks only in positions where they're having to come in day-to-day -day contact, there is a like the likelihood of their catching it, the likelihood of their spreading it is even greater just because they haven't had access, just because of their status, they haven't had access to, to health care. It's just so I'm 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 watching things and I just get so frustrated. You know, and 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 I don't want to see upset. Maybe I am upset, but we we have the ability to do better. That's, that's the other part of it. We have the ability, we actually have the resources to do better. I mean, we have a Congress sitting there debating about whether or not you're gonna give people who, who can't go to work, who can't feed their families $200 or $600 extra, but yet and still you're gonna still talk about putting in billions of dollars and stuff for these um, jets and stuff that we don't even, I'm sorry. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've gotten wound up here. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think it's off track because the allocation. But it's all I mean, I see the con they all all of these issues are connected, and we're now beginning mm -hmm. to see how they're all connected in what COVID is doing because we're you, you can't you can't not you can't unsee it. I, I guess is what it is. You can't 
once we know you can't, those that want to pretend like, oh, the one has nothing to do with the other, you don't have that excuse anymore. Yeah. Yeah. You can't unsee what's happening in our prisons. If you're going to just say, yeah, they should be all, you know, lock them up and throw away the key. Well, they're getting, they're getting COVID in the prison. They are. And we're going to see increasing incidences of that. <laughs> Partly because there's no control on the part of leadership, they completely disregard it. I mean, where in history can you imagine a president in this country or any other country coming out and saying, okay, you rich guys in your white neighborhoods, don't worry about poor people getting a chance to come in there. We're erasing all of those protections during the Obama era. So you can keep your nice white suburbs the way you want. I mean, we haven't seen that since George Wallace and- right. But the problem with that attitude, obviously, is this 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 um, pandemic um, is um, non-discriminatory. I mean, it, it reaches every segment of our population, and so um, as we've seen from this article, that it points out that the um, uh, the, the marginalized individuals in our society, the ones who are in the restaurant, uh, you know, in nursing homes, in places where uh, the other segments of the population, whether they're they're wealthy enough or not, are going to have to come into contact uh, with people. So this really exposes, uh, and like what Sandra says, this basically takes the scab off of it. And, and we all have to understand that it's affecting every one of us, no matter how wealthy you are. I mean, we see every day in the paper, the news, individuals who are in high ranking individuals in high places who obviously are very wealthy, um, contracting this disease, so um, this illness. So you know, it, it's really important for us to understand, and that's what's the beauty of this, if there's any beauty to this pandemic, is that um, people are understanding that we have to be concerned about our fellow neighbors, uh, no matter where they are and what they're doing. And you have phenomena, as in Portland, where what originally begins as a Black Lives Matter protest, primarily peaceful, with some incidents of violence, it then gets turned by federal intervention into a much more violent, much more dangerous, much more destructive set of confrontations. And what's striking is that what pe the people that come out to provide the buffers to stick up for the protesters, the wall of moms, the wall of vets, the dads with the leaf blowers. I mean, I don't think we've ever seen anything like that where different sectors of society that were previously uninvolved and uncommitted are stepping forward saying, this is wrong. This needs to be stopped. <clears throat> yeah, and that's the beauty of these times that we're in. Um, exactly. As we talked about before, the, you know, that the technological advances allows people around the world to see this uh, and, and to be you know, very upset about what's going on and, and, and becoming more and more involved and saying, we gotta stop it, it stops here. Um, and we have an administration that obviously has no clue to what is right or wrong and allows uh, you know, federalized agents to go in, uh, in in demonstrations and do what they're doing. You know, it's, a, it's appalling, uh, but that the nature of, of what it, what's happening uh, causes people to clearly um, coalesce and, and, and uh, reach out and, and take a stand where they hadn't in the past, which is uh, one of the good things coming out of, uh, of this situation. Exactly. Yeah, and one of the things that the media has picked up on is that people who have not stepped forth or had this experience before are having it now, and their stories are getting covered and saying, now I'm beginning to see what other people that we're trying to stand up for have to live with every single day of their lives. Very true. Yes. So what What's at the heart of the disparity? If there were a single element that you would focus on, each of you, who? Is it housing? Is it education? Is it work and income? Is it all of them equally? Yeah, you know, for me, I mean, obviously, I, I think it's, it's that's really complicated. I think it's multiple factors. But, you know, lately I've been thinking about this term essential worker. And um, I think really what we've dealt with in American history is uh, the expendable populations. And now we're, we're calling them essential, but really what they are is they're expendable. And until we 
um, have more people see that. I mean, there, it's going to continue. But I think people, like you said, are are waking up. And uh, what Bill said earlier, I mean, this this virus is no respecter of persons. I mean, <laughs> you, you can be living in a mansion or living on the streets, and you're just as susceptible. Now, treatment is a different story, but we need to stop looking at people as expendable. Yeah, and I think, I mean, to be honest, and correct me if your information or impression is different, but when we see images of people who are saying, I have a right to wear no mask, you can't imprison me in a mask, I'm a free American. These are not the marginalized people no, of color not. who are they're the victims. Yeah, which is, I, yeah, I, it's perplexing to me. I mean, I get it. I know the history, I know the politics, but to be so incredibly um, careless about your own health and so angry about and so willing to protect your, your so-called rights and privilege at the expense of not only yourself your, and your family, but everyone else, that just, I mean, I think what's happening is we're converging at the pinnacle where people are realizing that their privilege might eventually become expendable too. Right, yeah. that, that sense of en entitlement that, that goes with these folks who are doing that, you know, that, that, that's really disgraceful um, to say, yeah. I'm entitled to do what I want to do, notwithstanding what's happening uh, to my neighbors or the society as a general. And, that, and that's really, I think the problem one of the problems that we have, obviously, as Radine says, it's very complicated. There's no one, one problem. But I think uh, my, my idea of the problem is this, this idea that um, we have individualized rights and, we, and everyone has to respect those rights. Everyone has to respect how I think. And I have, even if I have no concern for the community um, and, and, the, and the body politic as a whole, uh, I am first and what I do is right. And that sense of entitlement is totally wrong. And that has been the, the problem throughout our, our history is that belief um, that uh -huh. one has that entitlement. And, and isn't that what's really at the core of all of this, that the inequality is knowing it's intentional, it's at the expense of others. And, and the people who assert it's, it and benefit from it, they know that. They're yeah. not apologetic about it. And now for the first time, at least in our political recent history, they're being encouraged at the highest levels. Yeah, go out and act like that, behave like that. Yeah. And in fact, anybody that gets in your way, beat them up, shoot them, exercise your second amendment rights. It's That's exactly it's, right. Un, yeah. Unfettered inequality. That That is exactly it. I agree. That is exactly it because people are empowered because we don't have, as Radine indicated earlier, we don't have uh, a leadership that is willing to say that these are problems we need to address. It's willing to just say, you, you know, you go do your thing. I'm doing my thing. And that's not something we've seen in our leadership and our press, certainly at the executive level in a very long time. I know we've had a lot of issues to deal with as a, as a nation and as a community, but this, this time just feels very, very, very rudderless. Um, yeah. And I also think on that note, Sandra, we also, our local leaders, they need to be more decisive because if they're not and they keep going, swaying back and forth, it's going to continue affecting people of color disproportionately. And uh, I think this whole idea of politicizing this virus and who gets to stay in business and who, who doesn't and all of that needs to stop. Exactly. And, and I think like, Early on in this uh, pandemic, if we had leaders that basically shut everything down right from the inception and closed it all and said, no, we're not going to do this, we're, gonna do, we're not going to get closer, 30, 40, 60 days, whatever it was in the beginning of this, uh, without considering or thinking that they've got uh, political supporters who say, no, we can't close our business down, we're going to lose money. Um, that sort of influence that goes on in, in the politicking uh, around this issue, um, that really caused what's happening now, and it's gonna continue on, and you see the numbers spiking because people are, are claiming that they're losing business. Yes, we are losing business because our leaders didn't get on top of this yeah. in a timely manner. And one of the things that we're also seeing 
is that a different sector of people who have been bystanders, acquiescent, passive for a long, long time are now stepping up, speaking up, saying, look, this, this is wrong, this is offensive, and we're going to join and take a stand on this. I don't think we've seen that. This may be a time of opportunity, but the energy, the dynamism, exactly as all of you said earlier, seems to need to come from the grassroots. Mm -hmm. hey. And Sandra, you and have I, some I, thoughts on that. I, I, and I think that may be happening. I know you probably had a chance to look at the letter that uh, John Lewis published in today's New York Times and also um, some of his services today. And one of the things that I kind of felt really, really encouraged about is in his letter, his letter to the young people, to the next generation of, you know, calling upon them and recognizing them for, you know, taking the leadership. But he began doing this when he was years old. Um, he began his own, you know, he got on a, I think President Obama was talking about when he got on a bus to go and um, do the sit-ins. He was like, what, eight, 19, 20 years old. Uh, at that time. And so to have that kind of commitment I, that early on, as President Obama said, it's like he was the age as the same age as his youngest daughter. And he began this fight and he continued it and inspired so many. I, I forget that you, I think we most, we forget that he spoke at the March on Washington. He was the youngest person to speak. He was about 23 at that time. I, th I, I am a bit encouraged uh, because we are seeing a generation, like you said, people who've not necessarily been involved before who are coming forward um, because this, this COVID, among other things, has just exposed so much of what needs to be changed in our society. And I'm actually kind of hopeful about the way, I mean, it's, it's not pleasant right now. There are some things that are just very, very ugly, but uh, I think I think we're 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 beginning to see some movement. Um, so hold that thought. Thank you all for your dynamism, your energy. We'll see you all in a couple of weeks and continue this deep dive. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks everyone.